Hi everybody, it's Chris, and welcome to another video by the Infinity System. Uh, tonight's episode is going to be pretty heavy-duty and serious, so trigger warning. We are going to be discussing uh, childhood sexual abuse, male childhood sexual abuse, and it could get a little explicit and triggerful, if that's a word. Um, so, full trigger warning up front. The topic of today's episode is Boys Cry 2, dealing with male childhood sexual abuse. According to many studies, over one in six males have experienced sexual abuse before the age of 18. A 1990 national study found that 16% of males had been abused by the age 18. A 1996 study of male university students uh, reported an 18% rate by age 16. A 2003 national study reported a 14.2% rate of molestation before the age of 18. And in 2005, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, in conjunction with the San Diego Kaiser Permanente HMO, reported a study that showed 16% before 18 years. These are staggering numbers. And especially when you take into account that these statistics do not account for non-contact sexual abuse. So, you may be asking yourself, what is the difference between contact and non-contact sexual abuse? Uh, it's obvious. Does contact occur? Again, trigger warnings. Three, two, one. Contact would be penetrations, either oral, anal, or any variation thereof. Non-contact would be exposure, say flashing, or exposure to pornography or sexual activity. Say, for example, a child being forced to witness their parents having sex. So, again, these statistics only speak for the contact ratio not for the non-contact sexual abuse ratio, which is much higher. Which brings us to our actual main topic, um, sexual abuse itself. Sexual abuse of males can occur by either males or females, young or old. There is a myth running around and has been for some time that sexual abuse by males is predominantly by gays or homosexuals or those who identify with that end of the spectrum. This is absolute bullshit. There is absolutely no evidence whatsoever of a higher rate of incident of child abuse by uh, gay men or straight men for that matter. But there's, it's, it's just, this is bullshit. It's a rumor. That's all there is to it. It's a myth. Um, there are several myths that go along with sexual abuse by males. But there's also sexual abuse of females. And one of this, these myths is the myth of the lucky boy. Oh, well, uh, he got taught the ropes by X woman who's older than he is. Oh, he must be so lucky, right? Wrong. It's not about the sex of the abuser. It's not about the sexual orientation of the abuser. It's not about teaching a child to have sex or enjoy it in any sense of the word. It's about one thing. It's about the exploitation of the power differential between an adult and a child and taking advantage of that vulnerability for sexual pleasure or deviant behavior. That's what it's about. It's, about. it's the balance of power. It's a violation of trust of the adult's position of responsibility over the child. And it makes the victims really easy to manipulate because it's an adult. You're confused. You may not know what's going on, and you've been taught to listen to adults and to do what they say. It's a terrible, terrible violation of that relationship that should be held as a sacred trust. Abuse is abuse, and it has absolutely nothing to do with how masculine or feminine you are or were, regardless of what your abuser might have told you. You didn't ask for it. Uh, you didn't enjoy it. And it's not weak 
to admit that it happened. This brings us to what I'd like to call the myth of the real man. And directly tied into this is our cultural and media representation of the alpha male. The rah-rah, Rambo, never say die, never cry, always out there, wins the day, and does so, breaking a glorious sheened sweat all over his chiseled body as the woman hangs onto his arm. This is something that has been fostered on men since <clears throat> time immemorial. Since the creation of media itself, and probably before that, just like the negative body images and whatnot that the women are exposed to. Both sexes get it. Um, it's just a little more... Okay, it's a lot more overt for the ladies than it is for us. So about the myth of the real man. Uh, what does a real man not do? Never show weakness, or pain, or emotion. Uh, here's the problem with that. The cost of blocking out those weak feelings, those vulnerable feelings, never showing your pain, never showing weakness, never showing emotion, the cost of that ultimately is blocking out the positive emotions, love, warmth, closeness. Eventually you end up emotionally stunted and with a lack of empathy. A lot of the reason that men are ashamed to come forward and report sexual abuse is because of this kind of a mindset, because of this dichotomy. There is an inherent shame of ridicule for not having thought back. Oh, you allowed this to happen to you. You must be a... insert nasty word here. You know, you don't measure up. You just must be a wussy or, you know, a weakling. You know, you didn't fight back, so you're not a man. Uh, that has nothing to do with it. You were a child. You were overpowered by an adult four times your size and probably three times as strong. What is there to be ashamed of? But there's always that self-image and guilt that goes along with it. You know, I, I didn't fight back. I, I wasn't able to stop it. I'm not good enough. I don't measure up as a real man. And that's a terrible trap to get into because that negative self-image, that guilt that comes along with the experience, the same guilt that is often fostered by your abuser, begins to self-perpetuate a vicious cycle of self-loathing and negative self-image, which can lead to self-harm, to substance abuse, and right down the rabbit hole. The main things to remember, um, the abuse was not our fault. Let me say that again. The abuse was not our fault. I don't know what goes through the heads of these folks who decide to look at a child and go, I'm going to go have sex with that three-year-old. I can't fathom that. But... Studies have shown that there is a pattern of manipulative conditioning and often downright threats that accompany sexual abuse. The abusers will tell them, you know, if you report this, I'm going to kill you, or I'll kill your mommy, or I'll kill uh, your pet or your cat. And there are abusers who will go so far as to literally kill an animal in front of the child that they've abused, just to ram that point home. So there's much manipulative conditioning that goes into this twisted relationship. There are a few other myths that are dangerous. There is the myth of patterned abuse, which is essentially that, okay, I'm a child, I'm male, that was sexually abused, I'm going to turn out to be an abuser as well. I'm going to abuse my kids because I was abused. Uh, this is bullshit. This is another one of those bullshit myths, flat out. Studies have shown that boys who are sexually abused will not go on to abuse others, overwhelmingly. Uh, obviously, this isn't the case for everybody, but this is a myth that just needs to be busted because it's one that we personally have lived under for a long time. And it was one of the things that, or well, at least since we were diagnosed, 
but we knew that we were emotionally abused before and we were worried about that being inflicted on our kids and it was our watchword and our guideline to not inflict that kind of abuse that emotional abuse and that mental manipulation on our children and we firmly believed in the patterning and that's been our guiding principle but um, but ultimately it turns out it's bs it's just another layer of guilt that you're adding on to your shoulders it's another layer of manipulation and a loss of yourself now again serious trigger warning because we're about to discuss something that a lot of men don't even want to admit to and this is another part where the guilt comes up and it's intimately tied with that and that feeling of helplessness and that manipulation that the abusers will put you through and it's that many boys who are sexually assaulted will often experience erections and orgasms in the process of being violated. This can also be, this is generally, you know, exploited by your abusers. Oh, you must have enjoyed it. No. This is not something that you need to feel guilty for. It's not your fault. It is a natural bodily reaction. It is the way that our physiology is wired. We cannot help it. During this type of assault, the male prostate is stimulated. Think of it as the male G-spot. This produces an immediate reaction, an erection, and can lead to orgasm. So, this is natural. It happens anyway. Your abuser is ruthlessly exploiting that fact to create a cycle of guilt and to perpetrate that abuser-victim relationship. And that victim-abuser relationship is something that they have been carefully cultivating for probably far longer than you realize because that is one of the common ways that sexual abusers will begin the process small gifts they call it grooming which uh gifts positive attention mental manipulation that eventually leads to the assault and the shared secret um it's sick it's really really sick but it's not your fault you weren't to blame. So along with this thing, along with knowing that, yeah, you responded, um, a lot of men, and you responded sexually to the violation. A lot of men and boy, boys and men will worry that this means that they are now homosexual or that they have to become a homosexual or trans or any other thing. Um, it does not mean that. It does not mean that you are predicated that way. Abuse is abuse. Um, orientation is, is not determined by abuse. Being abused, being raped, does not mean that you're gay or straight or anything else. It means that you were abused. And along with this comes gender identity issues. How do you cope as a male with DID, knowing that you have female alters inside of you who may want to wear makeup, dresses, carry purses? Uh, how do you deal with that? Particularly in the media-driven perception of the alpha male, the raw, raw male. A real man would never be caught dead dressing up in makeup and a dress unless it was, oh, Halloween or part of the gag or something like that. Being in touch with your femininity does not make you any less of a man. Showing emotions does not make you any less of a man. Communication, opening up, admitting your hurt and seeking help does not make you less of a man, male or female. What is inside matters. Whether you have female alters, male alters, 
it doesn't make you less of a man. It makes you more of one. These are all parts of yourself. These are all ultimately you. And if you're going to deny a part of yourself, if you're going to hide it or try to shun it, if you're not going to work with it, it's just going to boil up and bite you in the butt. One of our altars, uh, our tween Mimi, is uh, a 13-year-old girl. I am a 48-year-old man. Bridging that mental gap has been a challenge. There's no doubt that Mimi is a girl, that she is feminine. When I see the recordings of when she's fronting in the body, I'm <laughs> looking at another person. Uh, the gestures, the mannerisms. Does that make me question my own masculinity? No, it doesn't. Because that person is just simply a part of the whole. I am that whole. And I am comfortable in my own sexuality such as it is, because trauma does directly affect sex. And that's something that we will be addressing uh, in another video. Uh, we're heavy enough this time around, so we don't need to cover it. But yeah, uh, DID will affect your sex life. The trauma will affect your sex life, and it requires an extraordinarily understanding partner in order to deal with that and support and love a DID system. So it is hard to speak out. It's very difficult to speak out, even if you're just emotionally abused, much less sexually abused. It's difficult to overcome that reticence, to open yourself up to another person and attempt to share these horrible things, expecting judgment at every turn to be reviled for some disgusting thing that can never be clean again. But the only way to truly heal is to be willing to open up and to be vulnerable and to try to rely on others and trust others around you. Because if you don't, and you try to process it on your own, you're just making it ten times harder than it needs to be, and in the end you're letting them win. You're letting your abusers win. So allow yourself to be vulnerable. Allow yourself to open up to your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your significant other. Tell somebody that you can trust and believe that they will still love you and still find you valuable and still find you a worthwhile person to love, even if you don't feel like it. It's the scariest thing in the world to be willing to look somebody in the eye and say, I was raped when I was three years old, and again at four, and again at six and at seven, and at eight. To say, I was a child prostitute. I was tortured. I was raped. It's hard for anyone to say those kind of things. So we had some final thoughts after all that heavy subject matter. What can we do with that whole dichotomy, that alpha male, don't show emotions, don't show weakness, be strong. We can take that and we can turn it on its ear. Never give up. Never surrender. Just never do it alone. 
That's it for today's episode, guys. We know it was a heavier one, but that's one of the reasons we started the channel, is to dig into these heavier issues and to air them out and hopefully come to a consensus and help each other. Uh, maybe somebody out there can benefit from my experience, from our experiences. Uh, that's what it's all about, is giving back. So we're really curious to know what your thoughts are. Go ahead and hit us up in the comments section below and be sure to click like, share, and subscribe if you or a loved one is in danger or needs help. Please hit the links in the comments section below to get help. Don't be afraid to reach out. And remember, you're loved, you're strong, and you are not alone. I'm Chris. Thanks for watching.